Hey everybody, welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast. As usual, this is the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. As usual, I am not Matt Farrell. Matt is with me though. How you doing, Matt? Good. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm Matt's older brother. I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer and I will be asking the questions and Matt, as the guru from the channel, will be answering them. We're trying to guru. (laughs) Be the guru that you want to see in the world. That's what I say. Before we get into the episode, just a reminder, there are ways you can support the podcast. You can go to stilltbd.fm. There's a link there. Or on YouTube, you can just click the membership button and join us. Either way is a great way to support the channel. And if you're not able to do those, just listening and sharing this with your friends is another great way to do it. So today we're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode. This is the episode that dropped on January 18th, 2022. It is the episode that I am gleefully pleased to say ends with a question mark. Yes. (laughs) Is a tiny house good for sustainable living? Question mark. It's been a long time since I've been able to do that. And I know we've all missed it. I, I have missed it. That's why I brought it back. Yeah. You're bringing questions back is what you're saying. That's right. Yeah. Matt Farrell bringing questions back. That's right. So first question, who the hell wants to live in a tiny house? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm jaundiced on this as before we started recording, I was, l- I was literally just minutes ago saying to Matt, I'm on the verge of buying an exercise bike. And the reason I'm on the verge of buying an exercise bike is because pandemic life make Sean brain broken. It's, (laughs) it's been a claustrophobic time for Sean who is prone to, uh, bouts of anxiety and claustrophobia as the result of not being able to get outside, not getting enough exercise. And of course, a tiny house doesn't mean you can't go outside. In fact, it encourages it. A tiny house doesn't mean you can't exercise. You can do whatever you want to do. The tiny house don't care. But sometimes, yes. late at night, yes. when it's time to sleep, and Sean lays down to go to bed, suddenly Sean feels like, these walls are too close. I, <laughs> Sean can't breathe. Yeah. Sean need air. And... <laughs> I think it's, I think that similar to other conversations we've had, similar to off grid living. Yeah. Similar to you had your video about mobile living, people converting vans to be a mobile home. Yep. Living completely off grid in, in some cases. That's a very particular mindset, a very particular lifestyle. And as I watched your video, I was fascinated by very obviously brilliant design choices in the house. I loved in the one house, it showed the steps lift up to reveal that there's storage compartments underneath the stairs. And I was just like, that is a tiny stroke of genius. Every square inch is maximized. Using every square inch in a way, really squeezing every, and in some cases repurposing every square inch so that you, you showed that one house that had a footprint of that was half as big as the actual usable square footage within the home. Yep. And I, on a intellectual level can look at this and say, wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. On an emotional level, I look at that and think, (laughs) yes, I would absolutely lose my mind. And I don't say that as hyperbole. It would be some night at three o'clock in the morning, I would suddenly run through the nearest wall and create a Sean's shaped door in the side of that tiny house. And the tiny house would never see me again. It would, the last, the tiny house would ever see of me would be me (laughs) running into the woods, screaming to find the, the nearest new home development where I could get back into a home that was larger than a thousand square feet. That that is... (laughs) That's my exact, my exact thing. This pandemic for me, like I live in a house that's basically a thousand square feet. I live in a 1950s house and I brought it up in the video. The average size of a house in the fifties was basically my house. And today it's over twice the size of what my house is today. And I am somebody who's currently working on building a new home and my Mm -hmm. new home is going to be about 2000 square feet. So I am falling into that trap. But the reason I'm doing that is what you just described. My wife and I both work from home. And in this tiny house, even 
a thousand square feet we're basically on top of each other and my workspace is basically a nine foot by nine foot room and i live in here pretty much all the time and the walls are closing in and so it's yeah. like i need more space my wife needs an actual workspace she works in the basement it's not pleasant down there so it's yeah. like the, the whole idea of having a little more room living in a tiny house in a <laughs> pandemic yeah. where you're not you may be working from home and if you have a spouse and children in a little you know 400 square you'd be murdering each other i don't know yeah. how you could make that work yeah but at the same time god bless the people that are into this i'm not one of them but i respect yeah. that choice and yeah. i want to strive to be better and be more minimalist and have a smaller impact on the environment and this tiny house movement is awesome for that yeah it just ain't for me yeah <laughs> it's like I, I can't do it yeah it's i think what you're describing is that there's a tool for every job yeah and a tiny house is a specific tool for a specific person with a specific job in mind and as you're describing your home situation not too different from my home situation working from home during the pandemic really enjoying aspects of working from home, really feeling like I still have a job, which is effectively the office job I had before the pandemic started. But my mindset, my overall health, my outlook has improved in some ways because of removing things like a commute, yep. being able to have access to things at home that would otherwise, how do you squeeze enough time out of a day? Used to be a typical refrain. And those, those things go away. But then the other side of it is, my partner and I, we are basically on top of each other. I have a teenage son and when he's with us, it's, there's a third basically now full grown physical body mm -hmm. in this space with us. And I love them both to death, but sometimes it's just like, wow, I really need to be not near anything. If you were living by yourself, I could see a tiny house yeah. as being like unquestionably like, okay, I can make this work for a certain period of time, maybe a long weekend, maybe a, a getaway weekend, that sort of thing for people to do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm reminded as I was watching your video of the movie Nomadland, which came out hmm. 2020, I believe it was, it won the Academy Award for the director, mm -hmm. for best director. And it is the story of people who have not removed themselves. They, their goal was not to remove themselves from the grid. Their goal was to embrace some kind of nomad-like existence and they follow work and the different people in the movies in some cases are actually people who live like this so there right. are a few actors in the movie but the the movie also includes people who legitimately live this way and they did semi-improvisational scenes where they would work with the actors and they would effectively have moments of revealing their stories and some people do this because of a desire to get away from a society that they think is largely working against individual health. You know, the right. idea of like society is doing things, putting restrictions on us that crushes our spirits. Other people want to get back to the idea of the open road, the nomad spirit they see as something that's ingrained in humans. So the idea of being able to take your tiny house and go whenever you might want, it's that kind of romantic yeah. appeal. I wondered how much of that is evident in your research when you were looking at these companies, because there's always the, the unspoken ideology in salesmanship of, mm -hmm. oh, you're looking for a home. And there's the website of the home development, which is talking about a suburban lifestyle. And they're going to include unspoken elements, which are very clearly geared toward people who are looking for that 2,500 square feet maybe expanding their family, maybe getting a dog, needing a big backyard, needing fenced in spaces. That idea comes with an unspoken set of images and ideas. Yep. Yep. How much of the nomad spirit did you see as a the lot. unspoken of this in those companies? A lot. In all the marketing materials I saw from all the different tiny companies, it was all geared to what you're talking about. It was not talking to me. Like the messaging was not resonating with me because it was talking to that go-getter spirit being mobile, not not being in debt and being able to go wherever you wanted to go, all those kind of things, which don't resonate with me, but they're going to resonate with somebody else. It's like you could you could definitely pick up on those threads that they were putting into all the marketing messages around it. And that's not a mass market appeal. Yeah. It's like, t even though Tiny Houses is a pretty big movement at this point, it will never be mainstream, but it is a very vibrant, healthy community because there's a lot of people that do want to do that. It's just a 
it's still a niche market, but it's really cool that it's there. And I actually have uh, several patrons that I released my videos early. And when they saw that video, several people chimed, sent me messages saying, I've, I lived like that for three years, or mm -hmm. I'm currently working on building a tiny house right now. And, you know, I lived in a mobile home for, you know, three years traveling the country and it's, but most of the messages were along the lines of, it was a temporary thing. It was yeah. something they did for a year or two years or even five years, but then they settled down into a slightly larger house. And the, th the thread I took from that was, this is not a permanent way you can live. It's like, there's going to be a point, a breaking point where your life shifts and tiny houses just will no longer work. And you're going right. to have to go back to something maybe a little larger, maybe not a 2000 square foot home, right. but it sounded from all the messages I got from people, it was clear that the struggles we've talked about are there. Even if you're in the camp of wanting to live in a tiny house, there's another YouTube channel called the handyman. And he lives in Arizona and he built a tiny house with his wife. They lived out for several years, rainwater harvesting, solar power, off-grid living, incredible. And they just built themselves a big 2,000 square foot home that they just, is, they're now living in. And in his most recent video where he was walking through the, the place, he brought up several times of like living in a tiny house was not sustainable because he and his wife did it for years and they work from home. And it was like, literally like they're working like across the room from each other. It's like, hi, they're live, working in a little loft in this tiny house. And it's like, they're right next to each other 24 hours a day. And it was basically not going to be conducive for their relationship. They had to get distance to be able to be, have a happy marriage. <laughs> Otherwise they most likely would not be married anymore. So it's like, there's, there's a breaking point for even people like the handyman that was just like, I can't, we can't keep doing this. It's not a forever home. It's a temporary way station that allowed them to save money, save up a huge amount of savings and build this massive 2000 square foot home and basically be living debt free. So it's like, there is a, there is a reason why you'd want to do it. And I think he's kind of the epitome of like what it means to be a tiny house lifestyle because it's not a, it's a temporary way station. Yeah. I thought about that as well as I was watching the video, the cost savings you, you at one point lay out, if you had to get a loan in order to get one of these and you scaled it so that it would be 15 year repayment, the total repayment costs was under $600 per month. And yeah. that I almost fell off my chair because I'm a renter and I, I don't even want to tell you how many times higher I pay for a rental above I know how much that is. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's it really lot. made me go, Oh boy. And there Deshaun, was just, just to put in perspective. I have friends in San Francisco and they pay two to three times what you're paying for rent. It's it, insane. I, yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy from that perspective, the idea of doing the numbers and saying like, okay, if I can live in a tiny house for three years mm -hmm. and then sell it, pay off the loan, I could save quite a bit of money and that could be the down payment for a house. So that kind of lifestyle might be geared toward that kind of temporary tighter struggle to put in time and money for the, the larger space. I'm curious from our listeners, have any of you done something similar to that? Have any of you taken the bullet for a couple of years so that you can then make the bigger leap into something like larger home ownership, whatever that might look like? Let us know in the comments. You can just scroll down or reach out through the contact information in the podcast description. Moving on to the comments on your video, there was a number of comments that caught my eye such as this one from Stephen Collier, who wrote, it would be interesting to see a breakdown comparison between the cost of tiny houses versus massive skyscraper apartments. Your uh, analysis yeah. really did focus on the idea of home ownership, house ownership, as opposed to something that might be comparable to urban living, like in New York City, Chicago, or someplace like that, where somebody like an apartment, Like an apartment alternative. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't yeah. look at it from that direction. Yeah, that's, a, that's really interesting. This and if you were ever to revisit this, I think the the number of ways you could slice it could be very interesting, which would be power consumption as a whole for a building, mm -hmm. the overall costs of home ownership in an apartment per square foot is vastly different to that of a house. Yep. So and size is usually pretty comparable. I'm lucky enough that I found an apartment which I do pay quite a bit for this apartment. I will I've said that already, but I also have two floors. That's not typical in 
in Brooklyn. And the square footage of my apartment, I think you and I talked about this previously, it's either very, very close or I'm a little it's, bit bigger. You're bigger I'm, than my house. Yeah. You're slightly bigger than my house. Yeah. And it's an older building that went through a huge renovation to repurpose the space, which have, at one point, this probably would have been a building that would have had more families in it than it currently has. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's been repurposed to make it more attractive to this kind of, it's almost house-like in the way that I live. But if you took a typical apartment from generic town in the USA, I wonder how that would compare square footage wise to a tiny house. Obviously the tiny house is, it's making the smaller side of it, the goal as opposed to an apartment, which is. You and know, you own it. And you own it. Yeah. So you're, you're, you've got equity because you have at the end, when you get rid of it, you can sell it and make money from it. So you can't do that with an apartment. So there's, there's a benefit there. Yeah. I also like this comment from purple cat. Having lived in small spaces before, the fantasy about there being less cleaning is just that, a fantasy. There's, <laughs> there's less space to clean, but because everything is so tightly packed in, you feel it immediately if something gets dirty. As a result, I'd feel like I al was always cleaning and nothing was ever clean. There's definitely a happy medium between having to clean all the time because the space is too small and having to clean all the time because the space is too big. That's I thought funny. that was a... Yeah, the I thought that was a good analysis. Aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. And and I wondered overall about other ways that the psychological aspect could impact that lifestyle. Like I mentioned, you know, at at nighttime for me is a time when I feel like I sometimes struggle with whatever you're doing during the day can distract you to a certain degree to the things that are around you. Mm -hmm. Once the lights go out and you're trying to sleep and your mind starts to just kind of calm and quiet, suddenly it becomes evident like, oh, I could touch both walls at the same time. Oh, <laughs> everything I own is within arm's reach. And I wonder, there's a psychological, you know how there's different personality profiles that you can take quizzes and figure out what type of personality yeah. you are. I wonder yeah. if there's a standard personality that is more open to this kind of living than another time. Oh, hundred percent. Oh my gosh. Like the, the people that want to live off grid, they all are cut from the same piece of cloth. It's like, there's a mindset that you have to have to want to live like that. And again, that's not me, but I totally respect that lifestyle and that choice. And I admire it aspects of it. I really admire it's just, I am cut from a completely different piece of the cloth <laughs> the right. other, on the other side <laughs> of that piece. The last comment I wanted to share was this one from Julian Kandelhofer, who wrote, neat idea, but I can't imagine lots of apartment-sized houses being more efficient than an apartment building. Yeah. So that is something I wanted to touch on. Do you have any ideas as to, is Julian onto something or do the numbers actually tell a different story? He's, he's onto something. It depends on where you are, though. Like here in the United States, we have a lot of space. There's a, there's a there's a lot of space here. So it's very conducive to this kind of lifestyle. You could move out to Montana. You could go wherever you want and find a little plot of land and put up your home and Bob's your uncle, you're done. In like a European city, which is more densely packed, you're not going to be able to do stuff like this very easily. On top of which, I brought it up in the video, there's regulations vary here in the United States, state to state. Some states yeah. are more accepting of tiny houses than others. And that's really true in Europe. I had people reach out to me saying that like they're in Germany and they can't do this. They want to do it, but they can't. So it's like, it's just regulations don't make it doable. So it's, it's a combination of is the space available in the region that you live in? And then also do they even allow it? Like what right. are the constraints from the laws and the regulations? I don't know what country it was, but years ago when I was I was doing research to find a new apartment. It was a real estate search and I was looking for apartments and something about the way that I put terms into the Google search. Mm -hmm. I ended up on some very interesting links to a company that was basically making tiny houses, but they weren't called tiny houses. And they were, they effectively looked like little 1950s style UFOs, like a tiny little, either sometimes they were rounded. Sometimes they look like a trailer without wheels on little legs. So they look like little lunar landers and they were designed to be lifted with a crane onto the roof of an existing oh, apartment wow. building so that landlords could purchase a these and space. effectively add an apartment to an apartment building. And what you would need to have would be access to the roof. 
as they're so, lowering them down, do they play theremin music as it's? I would hope that they would, and yeah. then the there would I I think if you were doing it properly, not only would you have that, but as soon as the the house landed, the front door would open up, and somebody dressed as a Martian would come running out. Clack two, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Clack two, Verada Nikto. Nick two. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's why I was bringing up like the space. It's like if you're in a congested city or a urban location, it's like apartments make so much more sense because you're building vertically and you can get a lot more apartments into the same kind of square footage on the ground. So it's like tiny houses only really make sense if you're in an area that has the kind of room to to grow and allow people to kind of find their own little plot of land. Um, yeah. Otherwise, apartments are going to win. Yeah. Or putting these UFOs on rooftops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so listeners, let us know, have you ever lived this kind of experience. I'm really curious about that kind of lived experience, what it was like. And I don't know, maybe if, if we get somebody who's done this before and is open to a conversation, maybe we could have revisit yeah. this with an episode where we could chat with them. you for an episode. I think that would be very interesting. Let us know. You can find the contact information in the podcast description or on YouTube. You can just scroll right down to the comments section below the video. Don't forget there's still tbd.fm. You can support the podcast there through the support the podcast link or on YouTube. You can just click the join button and become a member and whichever you're able to do. We greatly appreciate the support. There's also supporting us via rating, reviewing and sharing us with your friends. All of that really does help the podcast. The podcast helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew and then Matthew helps me build a UFO. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.